Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Ian Richardson. Uh, I'm from ABB Australia. Welcome to everybody for uh, coming along to the Voltimum webinar series. In this session, we're going to have a bit of a chat about RCDs and talk about their, their history, the standards, and uh, how these devices are applied in industry. So just a, a quick little bit of housekeeping on the actual uh, webinar itself. On the left hand side of your screen there is a chat box. You, by all means you can ask a question there. Um, those questions, uh, if I see a question come up, and um, by all means any time during the presentation please do so. And I'll reiterate the question so that everyone can hear it and uh, we'll have a go at answering the question to the best of our ability as well. So thank you very much for attending and uh, we'll jump into it straight away. As you can see from the first slide, um, this presentation has been taken from a, uh, a series of presentations that we have called the Professional Development Program. This is a, a series of classroom style uh, lectures that we do uh, right across Australia and uh, anyone's welcome to come along to these there's no charge involved with it this is a, a quite a condensed version of one of the presentations in the RCD series and there's a range of other topics so uh, the complete program is um, is uh, advertised from time to time through Voltimum and through some other areas so we'd welcome anyone to come along to that but that's the basis of our, our information that we've got here today. Just to look a little bit about um, the history of uh, RCDs and essentially the hazard of electric shock. So. RCDs have become a mandatory requirement as we know over the last number of years and has gradually increased as time has gone on as, as new standards have been released. And it begs the question of why? Why is this the case? And it's pretty simple really. RCDs actually save lives and this can actually be proven very, very clearly. Back in the year 2000, the Australian wiring rules, AS3000, which we're all familiar with, it increased the requirement of residual current protection in a variety of installations and uh, there were some changes that were made to the regulations at that time in clause 2.6 and it strengthened the requirements for RCDs. So just before that moment in time when the standards came out, during the 1990s, over a 10 year period there was an average of 49 electrical fatalities each year in Australia and New Zealand. So that was a quite a significant number year in year out. After the year 2000 when our standards changed that average fell to 25. So the most significant thing that occurred during that time was we actually changed standards made the requirement for RCDs uh, more of a mandatory requirement in a number of different areas and we immediately saw a difference in the amount of electrical fatalities. So it is true, RCDs do save lives. In a particular year, there was 25 electrical fatalities in 2009-2010, uh, 25 in Australia and 3 in New Zealand. Of that number, 75% were in customers installations and 25% of them were actually occurring on the electrical, electrical supply network. So people that were working for supply authorities um, were unfortunately being electrocuted as well. So you can see that a significant number of the electrical fatalities are occurring in traditional customer installations. It's hard to actually say how many people were injured because we collect data quite well in regards to the fatalities. Um, it could be 20, could be 30 times more are actually hospitalised because of serious electrical burns. I know the uh, Master Electricians uh, a little while ago did a, uh, a spot audit via their members and this is just one of a number of surveys which are done and it was discovered then that up to 20% of all installations have very serious safety faults. 
So there's a lot of nasty things going on out there. RCDs can actually do a lot to protecting the general public. And of course it goes beyond uh, the possibility of people being injured. Uh, there's a lot of problems of electrical faults causing fires in installations as well. And this is another area where the RCD comes into its own. Checking on the standards, um, there isn't a direct equivalent in the Australian standards uh, of this particular IEC standard. The IEC standard 61140 rates um, a protection method as protection against direct contact. They call it basic protection and there is also uh, a protection against an indirect contact which the IEC standard calls fault protection. The definition of these two is effectively protection against direct contact essentially means we put up a barrier between a person and the live components. So that can be the case or, or whatever it might be which is covering the piece of equipment. When we get into an indirect contact that means that faults can be occurred uh, on the piece of equipment, something abnormal has occurred and through an electrical component we put in some degree of fault protection which offers the protection for people. When we look to AS3000, this is actually referred to as additional protection. So in the clauses in Chapter 2 of AS3000, we go through a variety of electrical network protection methods. We get into an area called additional protection and the first step there is in clause 2.6 and we start talking about additional protection which is our RCDs. So as we said here, if we protect away from our, our live components which is uh, taking away that possibility of a direct contact, that will ensure our direct uh, and basic protection method. And that's our fundamental thing of, of all equipment. We keep people away from the live bits. When we go to indirect contact, what's traditionally occurring is there will be a fault occurring in whatever piece of equipment it might be. You can see in the lower diagram there we're showing a, uh, an appliance. There's a fault in the appliance, it's livened up the body and the householder touches the live body, creates a circuit through earth back to the network. The person is now actually part of the current path. Clearly this is a problem and we need to protect against it. We can now move on to worrying, in effect, if a person does get hooked up, as we say, or suffers a, a bit of a connection to a live component and they have a current flowing through their body, just what effects is that likely to have? So this table is quite handy. If, if we say that there's about half a milliamp flowing, it's generally considered to be not quite perceivable. You would barely even know that there is uh, a current flowing through you, so it's quite harmless. Get to three milliamps, which is still a very low amount of current, but it actually feels this weird sensation of ants crawling all over your skin. Not dangerous, but a little bit unpleasant. At only 15 milliamps, we can get to a situation where you get a muscular contraction. So you can see here in the diagram, someone's grabbed hold of a cable uh, in the palm of their hand. You get a muscular contraction which will actually grab hold of that cable, make it quite difficult to release. The current will be flowing through the body. It will be unpleasant, not necessarily dangerous. It's only 15 milliamps. Uh, it will depend a lot on the circumstances of the actual uh, situation where the person's getting the, that amount of current. At 40 milliamps we're getting a little bit more severe and what can happen there is the diaphragm will actually cramp completely and prevent you from breathing and you can literally die of, suff of suffocation. And of course when we get into the higher levels of current we're still only in the milliamp range. At 80 milliamps the heart will almost definitely go into ventricular vib vibrillation and uh, it's extremely dangerous and uh, it can certainly result in death very, very swiftly. So in the Australian Standard 60479, it's not 
necessarily a standard that we refer to a lot, but there is this graph that appears in there. It's got a number of curves on it and a variety of regions on the curve which are designated AC1, AC2, AC3, and then in AC4 there's a number of subsettings. So looking at the first one, under AC1 we're getting up to that half milliamp range that we saw on the previous slide and you get that perception but usually not that startle reaction like you're getting an electric shock. So this is quite safe. In the next region there is an involuntary muscular contraction and you can see it's become a little bit of a curve so as the, the duration of the current is quite short uh, but it could be up to uh, 200 milliamps and then the curve goes away and then stabilizes at 5 milliamps. So we've got this uh, muscular contraction which is occurring. It's generally considered to be quite reversible. So you have that unpleasant feeling whilst the current is there, but when the current is taken away, you don't tend to have that ongoing issue. Into the next region, it's starting to get quite serious. We're getting strong muscular contractions. You can disturb heart function, but if the point of supply is taken away, normally that would be considered reversible. So uh, not a very pleasant place to be, however uh, there won't be a permanent damage necessarily. Going into the AC4 region, and there are a number of different areas. Essentially we're getting into cardiac arrest, breathing arrest and fibrillation. So depending on the circumstances and as we go up with more current for longer periods of time, we're getting into much greater chances that the heart will go into fibrillation and if we don't do something about that the consequences are quite serious. If we go back to the graph there and we draw a line below the AC4 region we end up with 30 milliamps. So this is one of the reasons why 30 milliamps has been chosen as our basis for people protection. Once the heart goes into ventricular fibrillation, you can see normal heart function occurring there and uh, you've probably seen it on the various medical shows with the machines that go beep. As the, uh, uh, an ECG diagram is showing, a heart goes into fibrillation, you get this rapid pulsing and it's a, a very irregular pumping of the heart the blood pressure of the person is going to decrease quite rapidly therefore they're not getting the required amount of oxygen transported around their body and uh, the consequences are pretty clear. It, it's not going to be a good outcome. And then we start talking about the building and of course uh, protecting people is only part of it. Uh, RCDs of various styles are also used to protect buildings and we're trying to guard against an insulation fault. So when you get a breakdown of insulation, it creates a leakage, it can create a small arc. That arc can then create a fire and of course the consequences for the building aren't that great either. So in general terms on buildings, we'll be protecting somewhere in the order of about 300 milliamps. Um, there are 100 milliamp RCDs available as well which, which can be utilised there and we go up in scale as well, normally by a factor of three depending on the products you might be using. So we'll go from our 30 milliamp to 100 milliamp to a 300 milliamp, there is actually a 500 milliamp there, then go to 1 amp, 2 amp and 5 amp uh, as we're getting higher up into the electrical network. It can be arranged in uh, a very similar cascading principle that you might use for, uh, uh, for selectivity of circuit breakers. So how does the RCD actually operate? Pretty simple really. It's actually measuring uh, the current flow going through to a load in its normal circumstances. So as a rule the current flow will be passing through a toroid um, that is measuring the magnetic field and as long as the current going out matches the current coming back, the sum of those currents will actually be zero. So everything's fine. When we get an electrical fault, 
As you can see on the diagram here, the fault has caused a leakage down to the body of this device. There is a earth return path going back to the supply transformers. This is outside of the circuit of the RCD. The RCD sees an imbalance because the current going out doesn't match the current coming back any longer. It, once it sees that imbalance, the device will then trip according to the, the technology of the device itself. So they're actually a pretty simple device, but they are highly sensitive because obviously they need to be because we are generally talking about people protection. There's a number of standards that relate to uh, RCDs, RCD being a, a generic term. We've got the residual current circuit breaker, which is correctly known as an RCCB. That's covered by AS61008. And people often refer to these generically as an RCD, but it's not actually correct because RCD is the overall family of all residual current devices. The next up, we have a residual current circuit breaker with overcurrent. People often ask me, what does this term RCBO stands for? And that's the definition right there. It's covered by a different standard, AS61009. Most of the standard is quite similar, but in this instance with an RCBO, the device also has uh, miniature circuit breaker properties as well. We can then move on to an earth leakage relay. It's covered by two standards, which we'll talk about in a moment, AS62020 and 60947, which is our circuit breaker standard. But there's a new annex, or relatively new annex M has come out, which covers these particular earth leakage relays. So that's a little bit about the various standards. We can also clarify classify our RCDs according to their suitability of certain waveforms. So the basic RCD is called a type AC. On the front of the device it will have the symbol you can see on the left hand side and this means that the RCD is sensitive to alternating currents only. We need to be clear on this it's, uh, it has to be a, um, I'm sorry, someone's just asked a question. I'll just get to that in, in one moment. Um, the type AC RCD, we're talking about the wave shape of the earth fault, not the supply that's going to the actual device itself. So if the earth fault which is trying to be detected is a pure AC, then we can use a type AC RCD, which is usually the most economic device around, to protect against that. The next step is a type A. Um, there's a minor difference in the Australian and New Zealand versions of AS3000. Well, AS3000 is actually AS slash NZS. In New Zealand, they have set a minimum standard for a type A RCD in all applications. For Australia, we are allowed to use the type AC still. With a type A, it does everything that a type AC will do, but it can also sense and react to a pulsating current or a, uh, a DC component, which is pulsating. So it's actually showing the halfway rectified in a sense um, coming from the, the actual waveform of the RCD. We get that in a lot of rectified devices or devices that have got a rectifier in them. They can generate a, an earth fault which has got this pulsating AC uh, style of waveform. If you've got a type AC device and you get an earth fault with this pulsating DC, then the device may not actually see it because the technology inside the device won't actually do that. I'll address the, uh, there's two questions that we've got now. Um, someone has asked, what is an RCBO? Um, they've actually typed RCBD. There's no such thing as an RCBD. An RCBO is a residual current device with overcurrent characteristics. So it's a combination of an RCD plus a miniature circuit breaker. 
Another question, is there any voltage control devices for earth fault? Yes, there are. That's coming up in the next couple of slides. So I'll just hold that question until we get to the relevant slide. A fairly new development uh, in the, the product standards has been the Type B device. This is also known as the Universal RCD. It can actually sense everything that an AC device does with a pure AC uh, waveform earth fault. It can sense uh, everything that type A will do where you've got that pulsating DC. Pulsating basically refers to the fact it's a half wave and going down meeting the, uh, the zero voltage point and then having another pulse. But the type B device can also sense residual currents which have got a, uh, a higher frequency, so that's up to a thousand hertz. That's not necessarily saying that the device is designed to go on a network of a thousand hertz, if such a thing exists. It's actually because on the earth fault itself, through a variety of characteristics, we can see earth faults with a very, very high frequency. And you need particular devices to be able to sense that. Uh, case in point is something like a VSD can generate a, a high frequency earth fault. The other two devices, AC and Type A, can't actually see those high frequencies and in fact they can get uh, quite upset by those higher frequencies. And this is um, where the Type B is generally by most variable speed drive manufacturers is recommended if you're required to have an RCD on a variable speed drive, you should be using a Type B. The Type Bs can also see an earth fault which is pure DC, which sometimes comes out from uh, quite complex devices as well. As well. Uh, questions just popped up, are there Type B devices available in Australia? Yes, there are. There are a number of, uh, I think, manufacturers, certainly in the ABB range, that's the one I can talk about. Um, there are a few different models which are Type B. Um, someone has asked a particular question about a manufacturer, whether they have, um, they have a device called an RCBD. Not sure if it's just a part number or whether it's another device. I can't quite see that. Um, yeah, hard to comment on that one, I'm afraid. Um, I'd have to check the, the manufacturer's catalogue to tell. RCBD is not something that appears in the standard, so it hasn't come from there. It could be a generic part number from a particular manufacturer, so you'd have to really look at the type of, uh, of device and its particular characteristics. So, moving on. We can also classify RCDs, and we go through the various classifications. Um, sorry, there's one question that I've just missed. Um, just to read out the question, what, which type of RCD should be used with a UPS, a Type A or a Type B? Um, it's a little bit difficult with the UPSs. Um, generally, because they have a, a front end on them, which is a little bit like a variable speed drive, um, they can generate some, some nasty things coming back into the network. They're very good on the load side because they obviously clean everything up. What's being generated back into the network, uh, if you're getting difficulties with uh, a nuisance tripping, the Type B will fix it. That's, that's a pretty clear thing. A Type A may overcome it. It's hard to be uh, more specific than that. The Type Bs, uh, obviously, because of the technology in them, there is a cost associated with them. Um, they're fairly new to the market, so uh, I would expect in the coming years, as uh, the manufacturing techniques get better and better, we'll see the prices come down on them. But they're a little bit expensive at the moment, but they do do a fantastic job when they're needed. And sometimes, there is no actual alternative for it. I've had a number of people come to me with issues with nuisance tripping and it's been completely solved by using a, a Type B. So that's probably the best answer for that one. Just checking if there... 
Uh, what is the milliamp value required by UPS? 30 milliamp. Yes, it would be. Um, it, it really depends. If the UPS is being uh, plugged into a socket outlet, our installation standards say that it has to be protected by a 30 milliamp RCD. So that is what you'd be working for. Um, usually the, the milliamp rating of the RCD is not the thing that's going to cause the RCD to trip when we're talking about a UPS. It will generally be because the front end of the, uh, the UPS is generating potentially a high frequency and that high frequency is upsetting a traditional RCD, a type A or a type AC, and causing the device to trip. That's where the type B will overcome the issue because it, it's resistant and tolerant to these higher frequencies. So a general style RCD is, is just, as the name would imply, it's used for general purposes. It's generally called an instantaneous device. There's also another device called a selective type, usually available only above 100 milliamps. Um, that can be used when we're trying to get a coordination between one RCD and another RCD. Be aware though that if you're protecting a, an outlet, a socket outlet, according to the AS3000 requirements, it must be an instantaneous device at 30 milliamps. It is not allowed to have a, a delay, which is what a selective device will do. We're not allowed to do that at 30 milliamps. So in the standards you can see here, it's uh, hopefully not too difficult to read, but there are certain requirements of the standards as in relation to their tripping time. So at their rated level, and if we talk about a 30 milliamp device, it must trip within 300 milliseconds at 30 milliamps. At two times that sensitivity rating of 30 milliamps or 60 milliamps, it must trip at 150 milliamps. And anything above five times, it must trip in 40, mil in 40 milliseconds, I should say. Uh, a question has come in. Is there a 15 milliamp RCBO for marina outlets? Uh, yes. Um, it depends on the sensitivity you're looking for. Um, and again, well, let's separate the RCBO from the outlet itself. If you've got a special purpose outlet, which is rated at 15 milliamps, uh, you could certainly put in a, uh, well, our ratings would be either a 16 amp or a, a 20 amp device, which will be protecting that outlet, and that could be rated at 30 milliamps as an RCBO, and that'll give you a solution. Another question, we're getting lots of questions today, which is fantastic. What is the reliability of an RCD? Is it reliable enough to connect to, and the rest of the question's been chopped off. Um, RCDs are extremely reliable, um, as a, a general comment. They uh, have been well proven over the years. The technology of manufacture is, is very, very good. Um, so following on to that connect, that question, is it reliable enough to connect to the output of a UPS? Uh, I think the reliability of the RCD or the RCBO uh, is not really in question. Um, certainly they can exist on the output side or the load side of a UPS without any problems at all. So it really depends on the load that they're connected to and uh, the types of influences coming back. We'll have a chat about the loads a little bit later because there's some pretty important information that I can actually share with you on that. Further question, what is the product life cycle of an RCD? Any maintenance work required? I do have, uh, have something and there was another question slash comment. Reliability is effective if regularly tested. Yes, that's very, very true. And the last slide that I've got in this presentation actually addresses that. 
looking again at our classification of RCDs, uh, an RCD can be either voltage dependent or voltage independent. According to our standards, we, we're not required to use one or the other. It really depends on the technology which has been utilised by the manufacturer and it can also come down to the cost of the device itself. So with a voltage dependent, uh, sorry, a voltage independent RCD, it's deriving its operating voltage from the supply itself. So as we can see here is a bit of a block diagram of the, uh, the RCD with its toroid. The line goes through the toroid, potentially it could have some windings around that. Uh, the neutral comes back through the toroid again. So if the line current and the neutral current are exactly the same, that toroid is magnetically in balance and there is, there is no magnetic field generated. If you get a fault, there is a magnetic field generated which will create an EMF, an EMF in that third winding which will go out and operate an extremely sensitive relay in the body of the RCD which causes the RCD to trip. These devices uh, are great because they only require the two connections and uh, they use the energy of the earth fault current to actually create the trip. That's why that relay uh, that's internal to the device is extremely sensitive um, and it's in the, um, the, the nano amp type region for its operation. So it's a very, very special relay as you can see. Certainly the ones for our devices and we actually sell them to a number of other manufacturers. Uh, they're actually manufactured in Switzerland. So uh, a very much a precision device. The second style of RCD is a voltage dependent RCD. With these devices, they actually require power to create the trip. So the sensing through the toroid is, is identical, but in that extra coil coming to the electronics of the system, most voltage dependent RCDs are electronic in their operation. They, uh, it actually requires a voltage applied to that electronics to enable the device to operate, which in most cases is not so much an issue, it's just the, the basis of the technology which is used. As you can see here, it does rely on a voltage source in order to operate. With the voltage dependent RCDs, most of the, or a lot of the devices will actually have a functional earth connection. So those of you who may have seen a, a device which is only one module wide, it's very commonly used and there's a variety of manufacturers of these devices. They have a, usually a flying lead coming off them for the neutral connection. The similar to a circuit breaker, they pick up their power connection directly off a, a chassis or, or a bus bar system and the load side is active and neutral terminated directly onto the body. Normally it looks something like an extended body miniature circuit breaker. But they also have this extra connection which will be a functional earth connection which is could be a, a white cable, in some cases it might be a green cable. The reason for that cable is a safety measure. With these types of devices, because the main supply neutral is being connected from a flying lead, which normally in a distribution board situation will be wired over to a neutral bar, that has the potential for mechanical damage. And you could actually, if the cable was damaged, you would lose supply for your neutral. Now you have to then consider that supply via the chassis in a distribution board is still going out to the load, coming back on the neutral, but the neutral has no connection. The potential in this scenario is that someone could be actually connected via an earth fault and they receive supply through the active because the neutral is not returning and therefore supplying the electronics to make the device trip, it won't trip. So that's the reason on these devices that we have this extra connection of a functional earth. It's connected to the earth bar 
in the event that the neutral is not made and the connection is not reliable, the device can still get a potential reference from active down to earth and in the event of a fault, the device will still trip even though it's dependent on voltage. So it's often a, a very good question that people ask, why do we have this thing? I have known people that have actually said that it seems like an extra wire so we just cut it off. Please don't. It's there for a very, very good reason and it should be connected to the earth bar. So just moving on, as you can see here. Our residual current device, as I mentioned before, it's uh, under the standard 61008, as we can see here, I think we've pretty much covered that. That's the image of a, a typical two-pole RCD. When we go to 61009, there's actually a number of different devices which are available in different configurations, be it a, a device which has been assembled in some way with a circuit breaker, uh, there are two-pole devices which are usually uh, electromechanical devices, also known as our voltage independent devices, and then we've got the electronic ones. In the device down the bottom of the page there you can see it's got a black cable. It also has a white cable which is our functional earth connection that we were just talking about. Uh, a question has come in, what is the maximum fault current an RCCB can break 6kA or 10kA? That will depend for an RCCB, it depends on the upstream protection. Uh, it depends also on the device. You'll find in the manufacturer's data they'll probably have two different ranges. Uh, some will be rated at a 6kA break, some will be rated at a 10kA break. It really depends on the device that you've selected, but check the tech data of the device that you're looking at. There is a range of products uh, which comes under the IC or the Australian standard 61009. It's called Annex G. With these, they, you can see in this picture, it's the actual RCD component. It's got a small bus bar across the bottom of it, and that is uh, made to connect onto a circuit breaker. So you get the RCBO protection because you've got a circuit breaker and an RCD once it's assembled. These devices are quite handy if you've got certain circuits which require a particular parameter and uh, you need to select a particular type of circuit breaker. It might be a, a D curve or a K curve or something like that. So you can choose the breaker of your choice, assemble it and away you go. One thing to be aware of, the standard requires that once you have assembled these breakers, uh, a breaker onto this RCD, you are not allowed to disassemble it you have to replace the complete unit. It's a, a quirky little thing which is built into the standards. So various manufacturers have certain ways of doing it. Uh, another question, are ABB looking at designing a four pole RCB O to fit onto a standard three phase bus bar? So I take it you're talking about a, um, a chassis type arrangement, um, yes there is a development going on on that. I'm not sure entirely on the timing of it but it is occurring. With our RCDs, um, actually the, the two standards uh, 61008 and 61009 were written some time ago and they actually came into being before the Type B RCD was invented. So a new standard, 62423, had to be created to cover the, the Type B RCD, so that's why we have that. And as you can see, they look quite the same as the other RCDs in the family. It's just a matter of looking at the particular characteristics. But internally, they are, are quite dramatically different. There's actually a double toroid sensing mechanism in there and quite sophisticated electronics. With uh, the residual current relays, um, these are actually a relay with a separate toroid. Uh, they're often used in switchboard arrangements. There's a couple of standards I mentioned earlier. 60947 is actually the circuit breaker standard. Um, there's a new Annex M. 
these devices are required to have a timing that considers the, t the operating time of the circuit breaker itself. So generally the, the manufacturer of the product, in this case an ABB product, we've tested the devices with the ABB circuit breakers and according to the standard they will all operate within the time that they're supposed to. The next standard that we've had, and this has been in existence for some time, 62020, that is a, a particular standard which covers a residual current monitor. It doesn't have this timing clause in it. So the monitor will actually sense within a certain time, it doesn't consider the operating time of the circuit breaker itself. So if you are looking at an application where you need to use a, a relay or a residual current monitor, be careful which standard is being requested. So the earlier devices complied with 62020. If the requirement is being stated as it must comply with the 947 standard Annex M, you have to be careful about which device you choose because there is a requirement of this timing. So just a tip. Looking at the, the various devices, and it's similar to what we had on an earlier slide, you can see that at its general sensitivity, the device has to operate in 300 milliseconds, or 0.3 of a second, at twice 150 and 40 milliseconds thereafter for the general style. The selective ones have uh, the possibility of higher currents and slightly different characteristics. There is another device which is shown in the standards, and it's called a Type 1. With this, as you can see here, these are the 10 milliamp versions and because they're a, a higher degree of sensitivity, they're usually used in some form of medical application. They've got a requirement they have to operate in not more than 40 milliseconds all the way through. So again, it's, uh, it depends on the device that you're choosing. Quick word on the Australian standards. Um, sorry, one more question. What are the tests made on an RCCB to use it as an isolator? Um, check the parameters of the device that you're looking at. Um, they are, by their definition, they're a residual current circuit breaker, so they can be used for isolation, but bear in mind they don't offer thermal or short circuit protection, because that's the operation of a circuit breaker but you could use them for isolation purposes. In A3000, in clause 2.6, there's a few clauses that we've got there, or sub-clauses, uh, about the selection, the types of RCDs, and the arrangement of the RCDs. Looking at the arrangement, this caused a lot of confusion when the standard came out. Uh, there are three basic clauses there. We can't have more than three final sub-circuits protected by one RCD as a, a general statement. If we've got more than one RCD and more than one lighting circuit, the lighting circuits must be distributed across multiple RCDs. This takes care of the case instead of having all of your lights uh, under one RCD, all of your power under a separate RCD, your lights trip and all the lights in the house go out. So the standard considers that and has made a, a recommendation there. In domestic installations, if you've got more than one final sub-circuit, which is generally the case, we're required to have a minimum of two RCDs. So I think if I was writing these standards, I would have put that one first. Um, it's quite clear there is a minimum of two RCDs in, even in a domestic situation. The only rider is if there's only one final sub-circuit, which may be the case if it would happen to be a bungalow. Uh, another question. Clause 2.6.2.4 has been changed by an amendment to the standard. I think there is an update on that and off the top of my head I can't recall the actual amendment. Uh, the first bullet point I said on that previous slide applies only to a domestic installation. Yeah, that's quite correct. Um, can I confirm the trip times again? I said that 30 milliseconds, should that be 300 milliseconds? Uh, yes, 30 milliamps, 
must trip in 300 milliseconds at a, uh, a 30 milliamp fault. So I'm sorry if I didn't make that clear. Looking at a, a consolidation on this slide of the various styles of RCD, we can see quite clearly what's going on. With a sinusoidal earth fault, we can use a type AC, a type A or a type B. With a pulsating DC, it's a type A or a type B. We shouldn't be using a type AC because it may not see that pulsating fault. With smooth DC or with a high frequency up to 1000 Hz, we should be using a type B. This is really the reason why the type B is, is often referred to as a universal type. Another point which is um, quite relevant, in the standards in, in AS3000 and also in the product standards it makes reference to this, when we talk about a 30 milliamp RCD for example, that 30 milliamp RCD must trip at 30 milliamps. But according to the standard, it is allowed to trip at 50% of that value, which in this case we're talking about 15 milliamps. This is called the uh, residual not operating current. So any time between 15 milliamps and 30 milliamps, according to the standard, the RCD is allowed to trip. So we have to be mindful of that. Some people, if they're doing a calculation of their final sub-circuit and they, uh, maybe they realise they have certain leakages occurring, it could get into the 20 milliamp or more range and they think it's a 30 milliamp RCD, therefore I'm OK. Uh, believe me, it's not necessarily so because according to the product standard and according to AS3000, it is allowed to trip any time after 15 milliamp. Most devices you'll find are tripping somewhere in the 24 to 25 milliamp, but we can't hold to that because there is that, that region where they can actually operate. Um, further questions? Uh, is it that a type AC won't pick up a fault of a high frequency? or just that, uh, and I've lost the rest of that question, uh, I think it might be meaning that it, uh, is it just that they, they will tend to nuisance trip. Um, they certainly, they can nuisance trip with a high frequency fault. Um, the device is not actually capable of seeing it. So uh, we've got um, a couple of issues here. If it's actually a fault, it may not operate. Um, because it's, it's outside of its design parameters. Um, if the supply is being injected with high frequency, it can also cause nuisance tripping. No actual fault, but on the actual network we're seeing a, a frequency being injected and it can upset the RCD. So this is where the, uh, the type ACs, and for that matter sometimes an A as well, may not see it. In AS3000, another question, sorry, there's, in AS3000 there is a type F that is sensitive for high frequency but not DC. Uh, that could well be the case. The, um, in the products that are generally available right now, we don't see a type F terribly much. Um, we tend to only have the type AC, the type A and the type B. There are some requirements which are directed to the installing contractor so that RCDs need to be selected and any electrical circuit subdivided so that any unexpected earth leakage device uh, is unlikely to cause unnecessary tripping. So this is important, it's actually being thrown back at the installing contractor to try and consider if there was going to be some leakages. Uh, the clause, this is actually straight from the standard. Installers should take care to avoid nuisance tripping due to uh, accumulated leakages. And we're, I'm sure we're all well aware of the accumulated leakages and some of the problems that they can cause. As you saw in the previous slide, RCDs can operate uh, as low as 50% of their sensitivity value. So we need to be mindful of that. The standard also goes on and, and recommends to the installing contractor that if there is known leakage currents on a particular load or on a particular circuit, it should not exceed one third of the tripping current. 
So in the case of a 30 milliamp device, the standard is recommending that any known leakages should not be more than 10 milliamps, which gives you that tolerance before the device may operate. As I say, under this particular clause, you'll see it's written exactly that way. Just a, a point, I made a, a reference to this uh, at the early part of the presentation. Um, certain devices have a known leakage. And this is a table which has been produced by some, some research. Uh, I'm not actually sure of the foundation of the research. I believe it to be quite accurate within a certain tolerance. So your typical computer, because of the switch mode power supplies being used, they can tend to have a, uh, a normal leakage under normal conditions between 1 and 2 milliamps. Uh, printers up to 1 milliamp. Small appliances, again, a, a small leakage, fax machines, photocopiers, and so on. Even uh, over the last few years, we've had a lot of difficulties with um, lighting circuits, with the electronic ballasts that are in them. The manufacturer of the ballast even says that they generate half a milliamp, or up to half a milliamp on each ballast. So once we start totaling up the quantity of uh, devices that we've got and consider that the, uh, these leakages could be occurring, we are getting into a threatening area where there could be difficulties. Um, a comment has been made, ASNZS3000 specifically says unwanted tripping, not nuisance tripping. Um, you have hit on a nerve. I really don't like the term nuisance tripping, although it is something which is very, very commonly used. Generally when an RCD trips, it is more or less doing its job. So I wouldn't call it a nuisance. It might be unwanted. So that's where that comes from and I totally agree with you. How about the earth leakage current from data centre servers? That can be an issue. Um, because of the amount of power supplies which potentially can be there, if we are required to have RCD protection in uh, the data centre, um, yes, you can certainly have some difficulties. So it can be uh, a tricky one to contend with. Another question, how do double insulated devices with no earth connection have a leakage current? Generally, they shouldn't. Um, but the devices can inject a, uh, a, a strange um, waveform back onto the network. Not necessarily a earth fault, but it can be something that can upset the RCD. So again, it depends on the device very much that we're talking about. Um, normally how many milliamps is a question. I think it leads on from the data centre server. Again, it, it really depends on the power supplies. If we look up the manufacturer's data from the, uh, the power supply, uh, we should get an indication if the, uh, the information is detailed enough to know what a typical um, leakage current could be from those devices and then we can do the calculation as to how many devices on one RCD protected circuit. And that's really what it comes down to, just trying to design the circuit so that it's within the tolerance of the RCD. What we're really trying to make people aware of here is that there is this tolerance and it's not the sensitivity value, it can be anything above 50% of that value before you could get into trouble. So just to, to go back and recap, why do we use RCDs? And that is a common answer, to prevent earth leakage faults. And uh, if I was presenting this in a classroom style, I'd hesitate at this point, asking everybody's reaction. And it's wrong. An RCD will not prevent an earth leakage fault. All it can do is provide an automatic disconnection when it senses that fault and provide, uh, uh, yes, someone said to save lives. And it's very true, that's what we said at the beginning. 
Uh, we're getting to the tail end of it, and uh, I thank everybody for, for hanging on. It has gone a little bit longer, and there's been some really good questions coming through, so I appreciate that. The, uh, with the test button that's used on RCDs, it is a requirement of the standards that RCDs have a test button, um, or a testing device, which is known as a, a test button. This test button allows you to check that the, the device is going to operate correctly, and there are recommendations about the, uh, the frequency of operation of the test button. Uh, regretfully, they usually live in a switchboard somewhere, and uh, in the commercial world, we do have good test procedures, and people are testing their RCDs quite regularly. Um, unfortunately, in the domestic situation, it very rarely occurs. The, the reason that we want to do this, and this is, relates to some research that's been done, as uh, time goes on, the theoretical availability of a device to operate declines. And uh, it's literally a case that things can get seized up or gummed up or whatever might be happening inside the device through temperature changes and all sorts of things going on with it. The device has received no exercise at all. If we are doing a periodic verification that the device works, so every one or two months we go out and we press the test button on the RCD, you can see in the lower graph there, in theory, the decline has been made to a more available state because we've been exercising the device. And this is really the same with, with all devices, be it an RCD, be it a, a very large circuit breaker that hasn't been uh, exercised or switched off for the last 20 years or so. Will it actually operate when it's asked to? If it hasn't had to do something for 20 years, you can't guarantee it. So it's a great idea that the device is switched every so often to make sure that the device is exercising and, and things are working. So that's the theory of having the test button and requiring it that it should be operated. According to the IEC standards, there is a, a frequency of operation and in general, I think if I recall on this, it's a little bit hard to read, but the IEC standard says every six months. Different manufacturers will actually say uh, a certain frequency. It could be 30 days, it could be two months. Uh, the IEC standard is saying six months. It's, it's really a case of, uh, it's a very wise thing to do to actually uh, exercise these devices on a regular basis and that way we'll ensure the best availability of the device. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. That is actually the end of the presentation. Um, I've got a couple of questions just to ask everybody here. Um, my question to you is, are there any further um, questions that people have? Um, there's a request for the presentation material. Yes, uh, I'm more than happy to pass that through via Voltimum. So it, it will be made available. There is also going to be a recording, or a recording has been done of this presentation. So that will be made available for all attendees as well. Um, so there's a question there, can we download a copy of the webinar? You'll get a link to, to get to the webinar, so you can show your staff without a problem. Um, a suggestion from someone to test your RCD when you receive your electricity account, what a great idea that is. That would be fantastic. Unfortunately, you get resistant from the householder because you've got that usual thing as you trip the RCD and they have to go around and start resetting clocks and various things of that nature. It's a, a pretty lame argument, really, because we're talking about safety. But to test your RCDs each time you receive your electricity account, what a great idea that is. Does an RCD tester require calibration? Yes, it should. Um, most of the devices are, are pretty good, and they'll give you an indication. If you're working with a calibrated device, you're obviously working with something that you know the situation with the device. So uh, if you're a, a professional contractor and you're using your device for, for testing um, and literally making recommendations on a circuit, I would suggest that you should be looking at yearly calibrations. So it's certainly a wise thing to do. 
I don't, that's the end of the questions that I've got so far. So once again, thank you very much everybody for attending. One final thing is, there is a, a survey that Voltimum has asked me to, uh, to put over to you. So I'll just click a button, it'll come to a new screen for you. So if you wouldn't mind just uh, clicking on this survey and completing that for people. And I thank you once again for your attendance and I look forward to chatting with you another time. Thank you.